Really, our goal is to provide actionable insights here on how you're going to navigate the next 90 days um, for businesses. And I'm sure the last 30 days have already been a very interesting challenge. So really here, the element is going to be focused on our, what are those key next steps? Um, if you joined us in our first webinar on Wednesday, there'll be a little bit of overlap as we did talk a lot about restaurants. So some of this might seem uh, a little repetitive, but it's still the foundational elements we kind of want to drive in and ensure that you know, everyone has uh, the basic tools to navigate these next steps. Aside from that, we'll really walk through uh, the details on how to deploy specific strategies. So, you know, a few of these will be relevant for your business if you're a takeout business. Some of this will be relevant if you're a dine-in business. Um, there's all these kind of details as we want to, again, cover breadth but provide depth. So with that kind of being stated, we'll kind of get into it and share just a quick background on who I am. If I can move, there we go. Um, so really on my end, um, I come from a deeper background on technology and venture backed startups, but more recently I've been enjoying and learning about the expansive portfolio of restaurants, food and beverage organizations as well too. Uh, locally here, I support Clementine Coffee Bar off of the historic uh, uh, Sutter Street. Uh, and then globally, I also support a, a fine dining restaurant and pop-up experience called Milano in Milan, Italy which if you guys know uh, and probably been following the news, that's completely closed down in the Italy region as well too. And it was kind of one of the first countries that I had to navigate as they were the first to go into isolation worldwide. Um, separately, and I guess you could call it the appropriately named Icarus is actually a restaurant that was supposed to have its soft opening today. So I'm dealing with it on kind of all three fronts. I had businesses that I've had to stop I've had businesses that were supposed to launch and I have businesses that are still up and running. Um, so to a certain extent, I really wanna share what we're doing to navigate around these. Uh, specifically on the fine dining side, it is uh, really rough. Uh, it's incredibly hard. These are not businesses that are built to do takeout. Um, so essentially it's either eating cost or finding another way to either set up a pop-up experience. I'll talk a little bit about that. But really in the fast food and takeout experience, they're quite a few options right now because food consumption is still up, right, to a certain extent. But the food consumption is different now. And due to all that, we really wanna talk through the data points and what is the new reality we're facing. So that's kind of where we'll start the conversation today. You know, there is a new reality and there's a new lens we all have to take on as business owners. And this is really tough. It's already difficult enough to run a business. As most of you'll know, it's a really tough low margin business. Uh, it's a volume based business and the truth is you're trying to build a singular playbook and scale it for volume uh, that essentially has been thrown out. Um, it's not an opportunity anymore because a lot of the assumptions we've known for our businesses no longer exist. Uh, and well, let's talk about what those assumptions are and what the data right now is really telling us. So it, it's stark, right? It, it, there's no way to sugarcoat this. You know, foot traffic is down by 70%. Average orders are down by 50%, meaning number of orders per day per restaurant. Um, bars and clubs have already been ordered to shut down specifically in states like California and New York. And you're seeing that now kind of go into a nationwide effect. Currently estimates range of 5 million to 7 million jobs lost in the restaurant industry. Um, and, you know, other interesting aspects that we could take into that are pros and cons, but we want to evaluate that with the data is recognizing that Americans are right now choosing grocery over takeout. Um, and that's for a few reasons. Uh, a couple of reasons for that is like it's bulk buying. That's something that really makes sense when you're hunkered and sheltered in place. Uh, it's family support because you're ordering more. Um, so the idea is that, you know, you're cooking at home with your own location. Um, but also at the same time, it's just the standard fears, right? The more exposure you have with any other type of person of going physically or you don't know the touch point of a restaurant, it becomes kind of an unknown. And that's the fear factor here. Um, so it's just recognizing that these are the truths that we're dealing with. Uh, the other element that is interesting, and it is the opportunity here, is digital. Um, digital app ordering is on the rise by 40%. Um, almost every business I work with, whether they are a restaurant or a food business or a technology startup, their digital offering is growing. It's because that's all we're doing at home. We're stuck. We're looking on the internet. We're on Zoom webinar calls like now. Uh, but it's also recognizing, right, that this is now the first way people are going to interact with your brand it's through some type of website or app at the moment right now, because that is where the lowest friction exists. So with that, the data is up, the, the data is interesting. Um, so now the question now begs is like, how do you do with that? So the other thing to recognize is like, we haven't bottomed out yet. And that's the, the, that's, the uh, that's the harsh reality as well too. It's a declining trend. 
this data is only until March 15th. If I was able to get to March 27th today, it's off this chart, right? It really is. And you're kind of recognizing because a lot of states are now updating their policies. It's also important to know that the U.S. has reacted slowly compared to most nations. So because of that, we're going to have reverberating effects that's going to take month over month over month. The good thing is California has been one of the ones that have somewhat acted fast. Uh, you know, San Francisco went into a shutdown and lockdown much earlier than most other counties in this area uh, in the state of California. Uh, but at the same time, you're now starting to see that, you know, it's going state by state, county by county. All these are going to have impacts. And these trends are going to continue to decline in terms of in-dining experiences. Almost everyone probably doesn't have an in-dining experience right now. It is a takeout menu or something where it's just curbside pickup. So just recognizing that this will continue to decline for the near term, and that's probably the hardest part about this. It's the unknown. And that's the other, other reality we have to deal with is that the timeline is unknown. So I use the term 90 days in the top of this title because that is what I'm right now currently expecting. Uh, you could talk to 20 different people and they'll give you 20 different answers. Uh, to be honest, I think 90 is on the low end. And um, for me, it's just knowing that how this is spread and how this shutdown will occur. And because of the lack of testing, we should assume a 90 day period at a minimum. And that's starting from March 1 uh, was what I would assume that from. So you're looking at a restart on June 1 in our kind of best case scenario. Uh, if you also want other data points, especially in the U.S., the strongest correlating factor is professional sports organizations. So as those open up, that's kind of where you're going to see the shelter in place open up as well, too. Uh, the NBA is probably the most transparent right now on their timeline. And again, they're looking at late May, early June, best case. Realistically, also looking at July 1 is kind of where most owners and founders are kind of uh, owners uh, and executives of the NBA are looking at. So just keep, you know, if you need another lagging indicator or a primary indicator of when that's going to open up, they'd be a really good use for that. So I get it. This is a really shitty picture to say the least. So the question now begs is what do we do? And that's kind of what the next steps are going to be is that there is a weird hope here. There are weird opportunities and it's recognizing how do we capitalize on that? And it's specifically going to really rally around how do you build for new experience in a dynamic manner? So as you probably have already heard, and we started our first webinar around this conversation as well, it, we got to start with the simple facts, right? You have to extend runway at all costs. These are the most important elements for your business right now. And this is probably the hardest decisions you have to make. So what does that entail? Just really quickly, like review your highest costs and cut accordingly. Right now, it's kind of two factors. It's staff and rent. Um, so on the staff front, right, you do have to make those layoffs accordingly. It's probably one of the toughest things that you do, especially from a community ownership mindset, but it's what's necessary. I think the big key is being able to communicate with your employees and letting them know that you're doing everything in your power to bring those jobs back on. So you could bring a predictable model when revenue comes, when, you know, hopefully orders come, you could essentially build for that. And we'll talk a little bit later on how you can better design for that, because really the goal is that you're not, you know, if you had a staff of 20 and you've cut down to three, you're not going back to 20 overnight. It's gonna be adding two or three week over week, month over month as that growth comes in. So how do you design for that? So then on the secondary cost structure, it's rent. It's the, the biggest red on your books right now. So the key is you gotta reach out to your landlord and negotiate if you haven't already done so. Um, I expanded upon this in our first webinar. It's definitely worth looking into as I talk through what are the ways to negotiate. The best way I could explain this is put it on your landlord, ask them a simple question, how can you help us in this time? If you could ask him that, you should be able to negotiate at that point to understand like where he's coming from. Because the truth is landlords are also getting hit too, depending on where their portfolio is. Um, the truth is, is that some have flexibility and some don't. So just make sure you have that conversation, but really ask that question first so you could understand their state of mind and knowing what leverage you have. Sometimes you get rent forgiveness, sometimes you get discounts, sometimes you can ask, access your security deposit. Try thinking creatively here as well. I extend on that in the first webinar, so, and it starts really uh, at the beginning there, so definitely go back if you didn't see that. Aside from that, right, is give yourself optionality, and giving yourself optionality means moving your payment terms out wherever possible. Um, this is, again, very hard in the restaurant industry, but again, you do have a community-based mindset, and especially if you're buying from local partners, they will understand, and if you have history with them, they might have flexibility there. So if it's as simple as cups, plates, et cetera, whatever you're buying, can you extend that to net 60, net 90 terms? Especially with a lot of these guys, they should be open to that depending on the credit line they have available as well too. 
And especially if you've been working with them for multiple years, the goal is that they're incentivized to get you through the next 90 days or they're going to lose all their future revenue as well too. So be able to tell that story with them because again, if they recognize that this, we're all in it and they want to be here, it's that same element also with your tenants, right? I mean, with your landlords, they're incentivized to keep you here because if you leave today, no one's coming in tomorrow, right? They're essentially kind of in the red as well too. So, you know, making a human conversation around this can really be interesting then for kind of all your partners there as well. Aside from that, know your cost hurdles. Like you need to actually know your numbers. How much do you need to clear every day, every week, every month? Your know, month is definitely more important because that's how most of your cost structures are built. But you need to have this and you need to specifically know how much you need to net. This is really the other issue. A lot of people focus on gross revenue. Gross doesn't matter here anymore. It's all about net. So in your guys' case, in order to survive, you need to know that cost hurdle of how much money I need to clear no matter what, because then you could design for that, right? And that's really what's important is that if you don't have a goal set, there's no way to design. You're kind of floundering, right? Um, again, we talk about that in the first webinar, so definitely worth going back if you want a little bit more details there. Lastly, just event, evaluate your financial offerings available in your network. Go to your financial lender. Um, look at what are the credit card opportunities here right now. Uh, if you do look at credit card opportunities, try doing something where it's 0% interest or zero payments for 12 months or longer. Um, there are offerings from Chase on that front. There are offerings from other companies like Brex and Divi, B-R-E-X, D-I-V-V-Y. Uh, and like I said, we'll follow up afterwards. But just know these options. I'm not saying apply yet. Just know what they look like because, again, you don't know where capital is going to come from the next 90 days. So the more options you could pull from, the better your situation is going to be. And that's going to be the other rule of thumb here is be dynamic, right? Have these options already presented for you so you don't have to do the hard work later when you need money in two days. You already know, like, I could turn up this credit card tomorrow and we're good. So think through these kind of opportunities. And once you know that, you know, same thing, talk to your lender or talk to your financial partner and be like, what can you do for us? A lot of these local credit unions should have flexibility. Plus, they're going to get funded through or have some support through the SBA loan grants that are hopefully gonna be coming down the funnel and pipeline. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. So again, this is just the bare minimum. Most of you have already done this, but it's really critical for us to walk through to make sure that you have this as a foundation before you can even deploy any of the other next steps. So what do you do now, right? I think this is the other key thing, right? As I talked about, it's not about gross anymore, it's all about net. And what you need to do is you need to optimize your products, product skew for net margins. One of the biggest issues I see with restaurants and SMBs and, uh, sorry, restaurants and brick and mortar retail chains, as well as that they have such a wide skew and the skew is more not helpful to their business, right? They might have a hundred things on their menu and 80%, 80 of those menu items don't actually have good margins. Uh, you need to cut those and you need to reduce your upselling of those right now. So essentially, right, if you can optimize for margins, you need to find what are those winners essentially in your inventory that you can uh, you know, essentially upsell to customers. So you know, what does that look like and what are the tactics to do that? Well, it's simple, right? First start with what are your top 10 selling items on your menu, right? Just look at what is selling with volume because that's what your brand is essentially built around. When you have that, organize your menu items in order to highest and low, uh, uh, highest to lowest margins of those top 10. Get a really clear picture of what's winning and what, you know, actually in terms of net revenue, in terms of money in your pocket versus what are those that are lost leaders, right? Uh, once you have that clear picture, you then have already a simple understanding of what you should be upselling a little bit more or what you should be pairing off your menu. Separately, the other thing that's really interesting here is that people are more willing to take on add-ons than ever before. So identify high margin add-ons that easily go into that offering that you can really serve up. So, you know, these are soda, drinks, snacks, and desserts. Find the soda, drinks, snacks, and desserts that have the higher margins as well, too. Same thing, another issue that you tend to see with all these businesses out here, you have 100 drinks, right? And to be honest, you try to put it under one or two price models, and like usually 50 of those drinks don't have good margins. Cut them out. Limit your inventory and optimize. But right, correlate it with what people are buying as well. So like say if you have one item on your beverage menu, that only has 10% margins, but 90% of people are buying it. Okay, you've got to kind of keep that on your menu, but you should probably reprice that out, right? Like you really need to be building for at least a minimum of like 30% margins, but targeting 50% margins in my opinion right now. Especially in this time of need, if you're offering customer service in a delightful manner, 
most of your core base is not going to have an issue paying that extra cost, right? It's more or less an understanding that your loyal user base is there to support you. And a plus or minus 10% is not going to be a larger issue and they'll understand, especially if you communicate that out. So figure out what are those easy, you know, uh, drinks, snacks, and desserts you can add on that you can scale uh, and add quickly to your menu, right? Um, you know, really easy wins are Costco chocolate chip cookies. You could buy like a 24 pack of those for like $12 and you could upsell that for a dollar if you want, right? Think through these kind of areas where you have predictable supply on it as well too, and then the margins will make sense. And of course, pair it correctly to your menu, like selling a cookie at, I don't know, like a bar is not going to work. Maybe it will. I don't know. Um, but you know, think thoughtfully around what actually makes sense for your brand and your business. Next, what's really interesting here is understand how consumption trends are going out. We're not going out to snack anymore. We're going out for full meals if we're going to buy. And that's really where your menu needs to be operating against, right? Like I'm not coming to you for just a croissant now. That's not worth my health interest to come out for that reason, right? So essentially, right, is that you want to think of those more as add-ons and then really get creative around lunch and dinner offerings, right? Essentially, figure out how to build packages. Build it where it's so turnkey that people are coming in. It's like, oh, I want to get four of your lunch offerings uh, really quickly to support my entire family. Think through what those easy turnkey dinner offerings are where you have like maybe four entrees and four different appetizers and they could combine them in any way. The idea here is that, right, you're all, everyone who's coming is coming for full meals now, and that's what you're going to see a lot of the data tilt towards. So optimize your menu accordingly for that. And lunch and dinner are kind of where the priorities are. And same thing, think through weekly offerings, right? Can you offer something for the entire week? What does that look like? Or two or three days, right? The, the less people have to go out of their homes, the better, right? So they're willing to pie that through you. And that's exactly what grocery offers, right? Grocery allows you to bring in $300 worth of food that supplies for an entire week. The value there is not because, oh, I'm saving money. The value there primarily for customers right now is I don't have to go out and I'm safer. So the same thing there is how do you offer that right now with your relationship to businesses as well? So try to think through what are your consumption trends, especially if you have data, like what are your most loyal customers coming in for? Do they come in every day? Do they come in every other day? Right? Like, you know, if you are like, you know, chocolates or cupcakes, right? People could probably buy for three to five days now, depending on what your service is or offering is. How do you sell that up to them accordingly if you have that shelf life? And that's the real key as well, is thinking of the shelf life of your product. So then maybe some of your products are only good for a day. What is a reheat product, right? Do you sell a quiche or a pie or a pizza that they can easily reheat and take home, right? How do you, you know, if you're a pizza shop, like how do you compete with take and bake? Can you freeze your pizzas? Try to think creatively on extending shelf life as well, because then it allows you to upsell a little bit more. You know, outside of that, you know, optimize your portions for delivery and takeout. Like this is a really easy margin win here as well too, right? Like cool, like these are smaller plates now. You don't have to put as much money, uh, as much food in and people are okay with that and it won't look different because the plating is different. You know, do this ethically, like don't just take half of it, you know, don't cut it half in size just to make the margins. You know, maybe you do cut a half in size and you reduce prices by 25%. Then you're still juicing your margins by 25%, but what's great is that it doesn't feel like you're overselling them, right? You're still giving them something cost appropriate. Outside of that, you know, you got to remove the low margin volume products as we talked about. Like anything that is not a winner, it's not worth your time. Time is your biggest asset here at the moment right now. So if you have to continually be selling products that have 5 to 10% margins, it's, you're not doing yourself any favors, right? And to be honest, in a wider funnel market, I get it. You want to have a wide approach and choice, but choice is no longer a luxury for your business. So really think through how you pair that down accordingly. And again, with that, you know, update your menu accordingly as well, where it's necessary to. So again, these are all quick tasks on how you can move to net margins, but also, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the next key thing is pushing average order value, which we kind of dipped in. Because these are the two core metrics that I recommend everyone to focus on, right? Net margins on one side, so you're getting more money in your pocket. And then more importantly, because volume is lower, you want to push average order value up, right? Meaning that they're buying more from you in that, in that singular interaction. Because you are now going to expect more infrequent interactions from your, from your customers. So the key then is like in those times, those essential moments, they decide to actually come to your brand you should be like throwing everything at them, 
as much as possible because right there's no longer any real predictability around this. So how do you push your average order value? So let's quickly talk through some ideas here on what's meaningful for your business on both average order value. Um, here it's like really simple. Offer bundles and packages. Like this is the easiest way to do that. If you have data, look and understand on your end, uh, you know, what, you know, a customer who buys this number one selling item, what are the next two or three items they usually buy? And how do I put that together, right? And make it easy. Here's a $20 package, a $50 package, a $100 package. And remember those numbers. Those are actually really important numbers. And I'll talk through a little bit later when we talk about gift cards and pricing as well. But 20, 50, 100 are really good bundle package numbers that make it really turnkey for most customers. And of course, when you think through bundle and packages, make home meal kits, right? It is that old school idea of KFC meals. If you remember, right, you get like your eight piece chicken, 10 sides, everything like that. That's actually really valuable right now, right? I get to stop one place don't have to make too many hard decisions and I still allow for choice and, and, and optionality for, for everyone. And I think that's what's really interesting here is that, you know, what do those home meal kits look like and how do you make it comfortable? Because again, you know, you could, especially if you could extend your shelf life, you know, hey, come to us at lunch and get your lunch now and take dinner home with you, right? What does that experience look like for your business and service, right? Similarly, right, oh, well, you bought dinner now, like, hey, what do you, how do you reheat lunch? Like, that could be interesting as well. Depending on where your customers are coming in, you could design accordingly for that. So, like, try utilizing intuition and gut, and it'll kind of go really far. Next is, right, like, offer simple and easy family ordering to customers as well, too, right? And this is kind of what I was saying earlier, right? Make, like, four entrees and, and four sides, and let them mix and match, because you've already batched them up. It's not that hard to do. Most businesses already do that, but make it easy where there's a little bit of choice, but there's convenience on your end. The worst thing you can do is offer a hundred different options right now. So even if you're like a small ice cream cart, like you should not be offering 30 different types of packaging and flavors. You should pare down to your top flavors. You should pare down to your upright sizing as well, right? No one's, you know, single scoop is not really going to be the primary seller anymore, right? Uh, that, that, that's for a short term use. It's going to be someone taking on pints or gallons or quarts, like go figure out how you upsell that at the moment right now. So again, you have to redesign and recognize the entire playbook of this singular interaction no longer exists, right? Or it's low value for you is the better way to put it. Don't get me wrong. There will be someone who still wants a single scoop of ice cream. I don't know why, but that person exists, but it's not valuable for your business right now. So you want to figure out how to push them up. Next is this terminology called whales, push for whales. Whales means that these are users who are a huge amount of your spend and revenue, right? Uh, if you run a business right now, you probably see one customer or 10, 20 customers who come in every day, every week. They're consistent buyers. They're a huge amount of your revenue. So, and, and most consumer spend, and this is more different for digital than it is for, say, restaurants, but like the top 5% or 10% of your customers usually make up 20 or 25% of your revenue because they're consistent. So build for them, right? How do you build for them and how do you get value? Specifically as well, if you have a catering offering, that's usually huge value as well for your business too. How do you now upsell catering and make it really easy and turnkey for those who still have large events to a certain extent? And I get it, events really aren't existing, but this is kind of the area of like, cool, businesses are still operating, right? So you also have to think through like which businesses are. Well, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but just off the top of your head, you could probably think through health and hospitals, uh, government infrastructure, logistics and shipping, right? These people still have needs, right? So the key is also catering to them, right? And if you could go after that, one of these accounts makes up 90% of your revenue, if not, you know, a huge inordinate amount of your revenue for that week. So the key is that you should spend five to 10% of your time chasing down these whales. Other stuff to think through as well is, this is an amazing time for businesses to step up and really show that they treat their employees well. It's incredibly tough on the restaurant side, but tech companies who already have revenue and if they have digital revenue are actually doing well in this region. Like Intel is kind of mixed, but they still are doing fairly well. They have a lot of their revenue still coming through. They have contracts that are secured. So if they're smart, what Intel should be doing is they should be offering business perks. They should be saying like, hey, we want to help you because you know, Intel employees are still working. They're all working from home. Right. If Intel is smart, they want to offer them support. So if, they, if I were one of you, your, your larger businesses and you could offer catering or some type of service, I'd contact these guys and be like, hey, 
if you want for ten thousand dollars we can support you know a hundred people to be able to pick up food from us every thursday at 12 p.m we'll give you a discount we'll make it really turnkey and it's a business perk that you upsell to them right similarly if they don't want to take on that cost offer them a discount be like hey here's a 20 percent discount perk if you get at least 50 per, uh, employees from your business to come by through us you know it'll be a 10 to 20 percent discount right the idea here is that these people still need consumption these people still need uh, a, a value and businesses are willing to invest you know and a lot of local businesses have already made like really large commitments like visa just noted they're not gonna lay off anyone AT&T just noted, they're not gonna lay off anyone. Well, if they're already investing there, they're probably willing to invest that extra 5% to have that delight. And to be honest, if I were a business, I'd be doing it because that's an amazing PR story. Like we care, we're supporting local and we're supporting our employees in this time of need. We make you know, easy pickup, easy takeout, we find a rotating business once a week and we ensure that we care about our community. That's the easiest win right now for what, $5,000 a week? That's the greatest PR you can get right now, right? So you also need to do the selling on their behalf because again, businesses aren't that creative right now. They're also in their kind of crazy mode. So try, try, you know, try connecting the dots there. And, you know, and lastly, you know, really on your end is just on the small side on average order value, just always recommend add-ons, right? Uh, I said this in my last webinar and uh, it's the greatest invention of all time was what McDonald's did with the biggie size. Thing. Would you like to biggie size that? It was one of the purest, highest net margins they had, and it was the easiest way to increase the offer value. And like almost over 60% of users converted. So similarly, if anyone orders, whether it's on the phone, in, 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 in store, or on digital, be like, hey, would you like to add X, Y, or Z to your menu? And be smart about what those add-ons are, but you're, that's a really simple way to boost your value. Just by saying, oh, we'd love to recommend you know, our orange croissant. It's very unique, and we only have it in store this week. Would you like to add that on? And really with add-ons, you want to think about value between 10 to 20% of the average order value. So if someone ordered $100, you could try upselling them a 10 to $20 cake or pie, right? If they just order $20, try thinking through that 3 to $4 beverage or you know, snack that's a good pairing with this as well. And try to be authentic about that. Like bring out your culinary skills. What pairs well? Oh, it's like, hey, you just got, you know, if you run a chocolate company, it's like, hey, you just got this chocolate caramel. You should try our habanero salted caramel. Really interesting, give you a different style and probably something you've never tasted before. Okay, like you're gonna get more yeses, especially if you ask, and it's a very easy way to increase your average order value by 10 to 20%. So again, you know, these all apply for different businesses, but hopefully it gives you an understanding on just a really easy way when you have infrequent, you know, customer interactions, you now need to move that value up as fast as you can. Next slide. Social media, invest. I know this thing, like most people hate hearing this stuff. Most people don't want to do this stuff, but now's the time to do it. As we talked about, everyone is interacting with brands digitally now. It's either your website or your Instagram or your Facebook or your Yelp page. Like this is where traffic is up and to the right still. So deploy for that, right? C grab attention where it is. So essentially communicate directly with your customers and i say daily like you should be doing a post every day and all these services that are meaningful you should also be adding text or video and photos like make this cool and with photos like share beautiful photos like it's not that hard you don't need to hire an amazing service for this if you have an iphone 10 and a portrait mode on it you're good like, i think it goes down to iphone 8 and portrait mode like it will be really good and just take a hundred different photos and then if you're not good at choosing, go find like a niece or a nephew who's somewhat cool and hip and be like, what's the best photo here? All right, and that's all you have to do. But do this and get this out and take a lot. And there, there's no cost to your business right now. I'm sure you have 15 minutes of downtime every day in your business right now in a restaurant. Cool, take photos everywhere, 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 everywhere. Build up a treasure amount of content, right? Because then maybe one day you don't get to have time to do it. You could just look at your, hey, here's my roster of 200 photos. One of these will look good. Next, offer discounts for these high value audiences. We, talk, we, we talked about this a little bit, like healthcare, government and logistics are all running, right? Folsom Partners is still running, right? Like uh, healthcare services are overrunning. Logistic companies are still supplying, USPS, Amazon, like these guys still need to be fed to a certain extent. So how do you offer discounts to them that are meaningful? Like show your badge and come in, we'll give you a 20% discount, right? And maybe, that's a 20% discount off your paired menu that you know you have 50% margins on, right? So you could limit on what that exposure and risk can essentially be. 
Uh, outside of that, right, like really try to think through how you update on all the platforms you own. The big three are really like Yelp, Instagram, and Facebook. And then of course, you know, your own website, but with the actual social media platforms, you should be owning these accounts. If you have not invested in your Yelp account yet, like that is the biggest area. Put new photos, make it up to date. Because again, by doing that, you go up on the Yelp algorithm in terms of discovery, right? The other thing is that people want to see activity. It's the worst thing when you land on Yelp and it says these business hours may be impacted. No, the first image I should be seeing is here's our updated hours with COVID. So no one has the question of whether or not you're open. Make it so easy once they land that, oh, this business exists and they're still open. Cool. I don't have to think about it. Let's order. Convert them to the ordering as fast as possible because you already have intent. But if you don't update that information, it's like, I don't know if they're open. Look, let's go see what else is out there, right? Like you got to think through all these areas where you need to ensure that once they've already landed, you're converting them. You've already done the hard work. But if you have it, it's called a leaky funnel. If you, they don't have trust on whether or not you're open or you're updating, you know, it's scary, right? Like, oh, I haven't seen them post a photo in eight days. It probably shut down. That's a pretty fair reaction to say the least, especially during this times when most businesses are closing down. So just know, update on all these platforms, own them right now. Next, like invest in your website and landing page. That's easily where you go. And please, please update amendments. Right, like if you do not update your menus right now, like it looks like you're out of date. There are a lot of restaurants even on Sutter Street. You know, it's where I'm locally at, so I see it in Historic Folsa. It is awful, to be honest. I'd say over 30% of restaurants have really bad websites, right? Um, really poor landing pages, an outdated menu where stuff isn't even available, or you can't even access their menu because it's some weird foreign PDF viewer reader that you have to install, which I'm not going to install, right? So recognize you have to go through that. And the best way to do this is ask a friend who's never interacted with your website to go through this, right? Just ask them, like to walk through the experience, see what they're clicking, see what they actually interact on. The other thing you should be doing is that you need to have a image uh, or a pop-up right when they land where it shows your update. It's like how, how, um, we're responding to COVID-19 or how we're supporting our local community in this time of need and a little bit of text from the owner, the brand, the manager, whoever you want, but just show you're live and there's something interesting there and that you're updated with your presence. That's a really easy win to get them to convert. Plus it's your best opportunity to really share your authentic story as well directly to your customer base. Next, right? Like really what you want to think through is like collaborate with like-minded brands. You should be pairing up whenever you can. Um, I know it's hard to do so in these times, but if there are co-opportunities, right? Like if you guys, you know, whoever your neighbor restaurant is, if you're located next to them and the brands work, try doing a relationship with one another, create a hundred dollar pack together, right? Whatever it may be, you sell food, they sell beverages, pair that shit together. It's not going to be a huge amount of your revenue, but it's going to help with a few, right? And it's going to push everyone's average order value up. Because the other thing is, is that if you have like-minded minds, right? If someone's going you know, someone's already, you know, bared the cost of going out and, and going to your restaurant to pick up food or like your neighbor's restaurant to pick up food. I'm pretty sure they're okay spending five more steps to go walk into your restaurant as well. So how do you guys support one another when, you know, already interactions are low? How do you support it by getting these conversions? So co collaborate with those like-minded brands. And it's even easier to even do digitally as well too. The other thing you guys should be doing is, sh you know, giving coupons to one another. So if you have another like, business and someone buys digitally on your website, give them a 10% coupon, not only to your business for future orders, but 10% to another business that collaborates with your brand, right? Just keep building that funnel where there's conversion there as well too. And if you can do that, I think you're going to get a lot of value out, um, out of all your customers as well too. And lead with authentic storytelling. Tell them how they can help you. Tell them the value of what you're doing. Show them the efforts as well too. Because, you know, if you're doing all this social media efforts, like showcase all your extra efforts of staying open, that you're fighting this for your community. That story is meaningful. People buy stories. People want to connect with humans, especially now when we're all awkwardly isolated. Like most people I've already talked to after our first webinar, the biggest value these guys got was just seeing other faces, right? Like if there's a value in that too. So just recognize that, you know, that's important too when you're communicating. Just a quick shout out, like a business that's doing this really well is Karen's Bakery. Um, I give them a lot of credit. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones that are doing well. This is just the one closest to me that I've been able to see. 
Uh, Karen updates almost every day or every other day on her Instagram page. She puts personal videos out, uh, you, know, at, you know, asking not only for support, but sharing support. She's also experimented in a very cool way. She added a marketplace uh, where you could actually buy like gallons of milk, berries, fruits, um, other stuff that you wouldn't traditionally get, but it was really nice. Um, transparently, uh, my girlfriend was actually visiting and we went to Karen's and when we saw that, uh, it increased our average order value, but it also increased our trust to go back. So in the last two weeks, we've been to Karen six times because of that extra effort, right? And then additionally, she just put out a sign, right? Please limit in-store guests to 10 people. She's being conscious of it. She's taking this seriously, but also ensuring that she's protecting her customers and her business at the same time. So this is a really good example. If, you know, if you're looking at how social media is deployed really well, uh, Karen's doing a really good job of that communication. Plus she has that brand and that's the most valuable thing. She's now transitioning her physical brand into that digital community even more. And this is a really great long-term win as well too, because again, those users are there. If they're following their account today. They're still following it in six months as well, you know, post COVID crisis too. So take advantage of that conversion. So um, you know, definitely check out their social media and kind of how they've been handling it as well. Next, like how do you build for curbside and takeout orders if this is relevant to your business and how do you design accordingly for this to essentially be better than the rest? Um, like take COVID-19 seriously. It's really simple. Like I, I think this is something where people just maybe do one or two steps like, oh, we all wear gloves. To be honest, gloves doesn't do shit. If one person touches it with their glove one time and they don't change off their gloves the whole day, they're technically spreading, right? The key is actually is like you only want to use like if you use gloves, you're using them for five to 10 minutes and then you wash your hands. Right. It's actually more important to wash your hands 10 times than wearing gloves for a whole day. And that's the other thing is like if you don't know the details and facts around your business, you're actually not really supporting and treating COVID-19 as seriously as it should be. The other thing you need to really think through is like how do you create the lowest touch point user experience? And this sucks for a lot of people because this is orthogonal to exactly how we designed our entire process. You want it to be high touch. Right. You always are going to shake hands. It's, you know, all these other elements were really critical for most businesses, making them feel like family and home. We, we got to reverse that. And essentially you have to create the lowest touch point user experience, right? You want to do it where you never even make physical contact. They never make physical contact to anything in your business, right? So like, you know, really good ways that I've seen certain businesses do that is if they have a credit card reader or a square reader, they take it straight to the car. And they just hold the reader for them for them to insert their card or tap their card and that's it. There's no other physical connection. They designed that and they did that all on the curbside, right? There are other cool ways where it was like, hey, put your card on the top of your car, right? And we'll walk by, grab it and swipe it if we need to. And, you know, everyone just washes their hands. They have a hand sanitizer out um, right there for display. And it's the idea of visibly seeing the cleanliness and the approach. And that goes really far in the community today right? One person sees that, they'll tell the next 10, right? It's like, especially here, we have like a very um, active mom community is what I would say. I love it. It's they all share and gather together. So if one mom sees this, right? Or, you know, one businesswoman, one business dad, whatever it may be, they share that. I've gotten huge recommendations of people who've done this well, because, you know, my, my mom is at high risk right now. So I have to go very extra precautious. So when I hear about this, I optimize for those brands as well too. So, you know, think through that. And the other key here is that, like, you know, highlight what you're doing. Put this on social media, right? It's not just seeing gloves. It's like, hey, we've increased wiping down our counters six times a day, right? We've now uh, only allowed two staff members in the back kitchen at all times. Uh, we ensure that, you know, we have hand sanitizers at the front door and we ensure that only one person touches your bags and never uses it with skin to skin contact, right? If that's the case, right? Share that and post that and talk through that and, you know, put that in your landing page because you might be doing all this stuff, but if your, your, your customer base doesn't see that, like they won't acknowledge it, they won't value it. So you also have to share it out externally, right? And lastly, like just go above and beyond deliver delight, not delivery delight. That's an error. Deliver delight. Uh, essentially on your end, right? Is like, make it like this aha moment. Like this was amazing. I could not believe this experience existed during this pandemic, because if you could be that first trust factor node over everyone else, like you've already built a recurring relationship. To be honest, like I'm willing to eat from the two cleanest restaurants for the next 90 days right now, because that's how important COVID-19 fear and risk is to my life. 
Sure, that's not every consumer, but that is a whale consumer, right? Like, and for me, that's been the case. I've appreciated Karen. Uh, I've appreciated Julian's approach. Like, you know, these are businesses that I've seen that have done the extra step. Similarly, if you can share that and people have that, this is also how you build a new recurring customer as well. So again, just go above and beyond. Think, think all these other weird things, right? Leave your doors open, right? Or go buy installed attachments of foot openings. Like, I don't know if you know, uh, hard to explain verbally right now, but in short, the worst thing about going to a bathroom or anything is that after you wash your hands, you still have to like open the handle or touch a door. Like now there's these things where you can hook on the bottom of your door where you use your foot to open it up, right? Like that goes really far right now for me because again, like any touch point has exposure to COVID-19. And that's like a $50 buy-on, you can install it yourself and you essentially have now made it a little bit of a nicer touch point. Same thing, open your front door where anyone can kind of come in and they don't have to touch anything as well. So really the best way I can highlight this for you is walk through as a blind customer like yourself. You're coming for the first time, you've never seen this. How many times did I have to touch to make an order? Right, other things to think through, like touching physical menus are not good, right? Those are plastic based menus. So like, how do I now have a digital display of my menu? If you haven't, you know, I mean, I know it's hard to say, but if you have an extra TV, right? You should put a digital menu that no one has to touch, but it's large enough for everyone to see in line, right? Or, you know, there's an iPad app that they could download on their own phone or you could view it and you tell them the direct URL link for that. So just think through all this and it goes really far. And of course, every business is different, um, but this is just another way of how you go above and beyond. Really quickly, like this is a new area that I know most businesses hate and you probably haven't been working with it, but let's just dive into it. Like these delivery services and platforms of um, you know, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, what do they mean and how do you actually utilize them? So the blunt truth is you should be utilizing them, but you should be utilizing them on your own terms. Their margins are awful, right? The commissions that they get, they try to take on most of these businesses really make it a, a struggle for you. So the key here right now is to get really, really deep to be able to provide that support. So how do you do that? Well, again, whenever, if you ever consider partnering with these guys, create a limited menu just for those platforms. You don't put your full menu on, it goes back to that stuff we were talking about at the top. Only the best margin ones should be winning on here. So stuff that have over you know, 40, 50% margins, those are the only things you want to go, or whatever your highest margins are. You got some 90% margin items, awesome. Push those there. The key here is, right, take high quality photos of those items, right? These always boost sales conversion, usually over 30%, because people want to see what they're buying. More importantly, show them what they're buying in that takeout. Like, how do they get it delivered to them? If they see that entire process just for COVID-19, very easy win there, right? And um, again, helps elevate your brand. You know, test differing, different offerings and menu items. This is a really fun way to be creative, right? If you have a limited menu, right, try adding a new menu item once a week and see what people are willing to buy. And of course, make sure it has the margins, but you could really get creative here to see what people are really utilizing. Next is like negotiate with each of these platforms because all these platforms are essentially commodities in their business. The great thing here is that you could technically negotiate and try getting offset terms. So stuff like, hey, I don't want any commissions for the first 30 days or 90 days. Or hey, can we reduce it down by 50% of what you're asking? It never hurts to ask. There's a little bit of leverage here because again, all these platforms are commodities. You might be able to get it and we've been able to be successful on this front as well too. Um, outside of that, right, you can offer exclusivity and that's the other way that you can negotiate. It's like, I'll only use DoorDash if you drop your commissions down. And that's okay for you, right? Any way for you to be able on these platforms is valuable. So try to think through all those leverages there. The great thing about this is you just capture new digital users, right? This is where a lot of people are buying and you get to be front and center with them and that's super highly valuable, so definitely do that. Lastly, like if you wanna get those users back, just add a physical discount card in every order. Like put it on the bottom of the bag, that says, hey, remember, if you call us, we'll give you a 10% discount directly. And that's always gonna beat the margins you're giving out to these platforms. So that's another way to retain that customer directly and do it with real narrative, like help our local business. We actually do better when you buy direct. Don't tell these platforms you're doing it, just you know, hide that, hide that in the bag. It works really well and it's a great way to convert those users back to you as well. So if you get digital discovery, then you could transition them to be able to get the direct margins as well and give them a nice discount in order to do that as well. So again, leverage for each of these platforms if you want to go with it, highly recommend to do it. I, I, whatever it may be, even if you just put one item there, just put it there because you're going to get free ad impressions. The great thing about this is that 
they have huge amounts of users already. So it's a built-in user base that's already going into it as well. So you should leverage that and be able to get in that audience so that people just see your brand, your top of mind, wherever it may be. They might not convert for sales because you don't have a huge venue, but they're aware of your brand and that's good too. Let's talk really quickly through gift card. These are amazing if used correctly. Um, in short, really what you want to understand is those number principles I talked about earlier. Um, I'm bringing them up again. It's 20, 50, 100. Uh, I really would recommend really focusing on the 50 to 100 because as we talked about, average order value matters here at this point. In this kind of scenario here, what's really exciting is you should be offering bonus values for those 50 to $100 gift cards. Usually I would say a 20% bonus value. So i.e. if they are, you're buying $50, you give them a $10 free. But don't give them a $10 free gift card. Give them a $10 valued item, right? So in this case, right, $10 a package of bread or something like that. Because in that, you have net margins as well. So your only cost you're actually giving up is like 4 or $5 for that incentivization. So you actually reduce the exposure of your free giving. But the reason you do this is A, you incentivize at the higher price points and you only give those values at the $50 to $100 gift cards. And more importantly, what's great about this is that these are pure net margins for your business, uh, at least in the near term, right? Of course, on redemption, but that's the great thing about gift cards. Like if you don't know the dirty secret about the gift card industry, the way gift card companies, like when you buy gift cards from Rayleigh's or Safeway, you see all those, the way those guys really make money is not the cuts or percentages. It's actually brilliant. They make money because you forget to use your gift card or you lose them. That's pure net cash to those businesses. Over 38% of gift cards go unused or get lost. And that's just cash disappeared. So it goes straight into their pocket. So it's really weird on how the industry is built, but that's really where the net margins are. I'm not saying you're incentivizing or building this for people to lose it, but the idea is that you're able to capture those net margins directly as well. Next, right, communicate the value of gift cards to your local, local customer, loyal customers. This is what everyone forgets to do. Like, just tell them honestly, like gift cards are the most valuable thing for us because we could put that hundred dollars to use right now to our business. We need to support. And this is the best way you can offer help. If you could use this hundred dollar gift card when everything comes back, that's even better, right? Like, cool. Like if you're Karen's bakery and you already come, like you should be buying a hundred, five hundred thousand dollar gift cards. Cause you know, you're going to go to Karen's a hundred times after this whole COVID pandemic. So if you communicate that with your customers, it's going to be really interesting. And you know, it's a really easy way to convert. Next, you know, if you don't want to do any of these discounts, that's fine. The easiest way you could also just add and just provide $5 gift cards to your high value customers or you know, high order value customers. If anyone orders over $100, just put a $5 gift card in. Here's the greatest thing. No one wants to waste a gift card. So if they've already bought $100, that $5, they're probably going to come back to buy another $50 to $100. And that's worth it in your business right now, considering, you know, where you need to get as many recurring customers as possible. So you're willing to take that 5% loss, you know, five to 7% blended loss because you're going to get a larger order value as well too. But again, this only makes sense if your margins make sense all the way through. So you need to maintain that, but assume, right? Like no one's going to come with a $5 gift card to buy a $5 croissant only. Like in this current climate, that's not how it's going to work. So just trying to think through that. It could be a $2 gift card. You figure out the number that pertains to your business, but just drop those for free. And again, you're delivering delight, which is going to go really far as well. Lastly, and we'll talk about a little bit more at the end of this call as well, the Greater Fulton Partners also have a partnership on a gift card provider called the Gift Card Cafe. Uh, we'll share links and how to sign up for that as well. And they're offering up to $1,000 in free gift cards for you to be able to sell with no, no cost outside of the, the tra traditional transaction cost. And there's kind of a lowered uh, percentage as well. And uh, we'll have Joe kind of talk about that shortly. Cool. We're almost done. Uh, I know we're kind of going over, so I'm going to kind of run through this really quickly. Um, really fast, like be proactive for loans and services. This is your biggest opportunity. This is the number one thing SBA, uh, uh, a small business should be focusing on. This is not only restaurants, this is any type of small business out there in the world, right? Start preparing for your applications today. Like start answering the questions. How has COVID-19 impacted you? What value do you offer to the community? How would you use the capital? Have these questions already answered in a text file that you can copy paste and apply to all the different applications that are going to come through. Next, like be up to date on local, state, and federal capital. Know what's happening and know what the relationships are where capital sources are coming to you. Like we're gonna talk really specifically uh, in the next slide about federal, because that's gonna be the most important thing right now with the new $2 trillion stimulus package. Next, like apply as early as you can. Know when those application dates open and then apply within that first like five minutes realistically, first hour at the latest. These things dry up incredibly fast. As I talked about before, 
the Sacramento $1 million relief program was gone in the first day, right? It, it was gone instantly, right? The idea is that these aren't going to stay up for long because the other thing is most, most local councils, unfortunately, are underestimating needs, right? And you need billions of dollars, not millions of dollars right now. And that's the only thing that can happen at the federal level, and we'll talk about that. You know, work with local SBA and loan experts, right? Just talk to SBA advisors. There's quite a few that are free as well. Like reach out and start having that relationship today. Um, you know, don't come in cold. The colder you are on this, the less likely you're gonna convert on these loans. And the truth is capital is now on a first come first serve basis. So you need to apply correctly and act fast. Next, like apply to tech funds from Facebook and Yelp. That's the other great thing here is that other tech companies are offering it. And there's quite a few other free and discounted resources out there. You know, there are services like, um, Scribd is one I noted, Zapier is one I noted. They're offering like 30 days, three months of free premium services. This is now the time to leverage it. You know, if you use Adobe Creative Suite, you just email Adobe and tell them your situation. They'll give you Creative Suite free for 90 days. Um, you know, outside of that, if you need to look at like business analytics, there's a company called Wompley, W-O-M-P-L-Y. And they're offering like $1,000 free grants pretty much and a free 90 day service uh, access to their premium analytics on your users. Really cool stuff, you know, and you're going to see other businesses be able to do that. So be ready to apply for them as well. Essentially, right, as I talked about, federal is the most important thing. So this is a crazy slide, but it is going to show you where the breakdown of the $2 million stimulus capital is going to be. And you really want to focus in the small business. It's this kind of light peach color, third from the bottom, uh, $377 billion. This is what the money we're going after. There are going to be right now $350 billion in new loans. That is what you're going to start applying for. That is the most critical thing. Timeline and dates are still a little bit unknown as everything's kind of getting sorted out on the fly. You need to be updated every day. You need to know exactly when this is happening, right? Because this $350 billion can allow your business to raise six to seven figures, depending on what your situation is, right? If you could even get five figures, right? Like twenty-five dollars to $50,000, this is incredibly meaningful for your organization. And if you're a little bit larger scale, you know, this will potentially go up to a million dollars as well too. So just something to recognize, this is what we're applying for. But 350 billion sounds like a lot now. It doesn't mean anything when you consider this is nationally required. Everything we're feeling here in our local community, every community is feeling, right? Some even worse. So it's just important to recognize that. But it's an opportunity and it's pretty exciting right now. Is this really where we're all going to focus on over the next 30 to 60 days? Okay, we're done with all this stuff. Just really quickly, um, on our end, we want to help a lot of like local businesses. So with Tribe, we're just gonna we're open to working with like five local partners. And like to be honest, it's not a selling you shit. Like we'll do everything heavily discounted. We just want to work with local partners to help them navigate, and we'll also defer like all of our costs and heavily discount it for like ninety to one hundred twenty days as well too. The important thing here is to recognize is like if we could help you, let us know. Tell us about your business and what your needs are right now, and we'll help give you like an action plan, help you navigate, and even help deploy to a certain extent if it's a business that fits our needs. Essentially on our end, right, the community matters. We need this area to succeed, and we're already working with quite a few local businesses today. So we have the ability to bring on like five partners. Like don't worry about cost structures or anything like that. If there's a meaningful value we can offer, just reach out. We, we can at least point you to the right direction or see if our team can get on there as well. Separately, in order to support this too, I just want to share with you guys everything that I provided with you today, I'm going to now deploy over the next two weeks. So you get to see a live case study of all this information being deployed for a local brand here called Clementine Coffee. Um, we have a retail location right here off Sutter Street and then a roastery in Auburn as well too. So here, our goal is that we're going to update the website, we're going to invest in wholesale retail, we're going to show you how we navigated our cost structure. And essentially, by just going to this website every couple of days, you'll start seeing all the changes, right? Because we haven't impacted or done any of the changes I've noted yet. I want to do this as a live case study for this business. So we can also show you that if deployed correctly, there's a really good chance that you could increase your revenue as well. For example, Clementine just did a all-time high in digital revenue last week. So for us, we're already starting to make those changes, but you're going to be able to see that deployed. Outside of that, if any of you want to try, we're putting out our discounts as well. If there are any wholesale and retail partners who want to meet, same thing. You know, we're about to create a package for um, you know, medical where we're going to offer everything at cost just to be able to help our healthcare professionals as well too. And if you want to try any of our products as well, use Folsom Strong, you'll get a 25% discount there as well. 
So again, the great thing here is that you'll see this in action. And I think that's going to be the most important thing that we can offer is that we want to deliver what we say with real, real quality results.